record, otherwise this is going to be a pain to yoink off Twitch again. Um, 350, okay. So you have your, basically it's part two of your Git lab is up and live. It is part individual, part team. So please make sure you read through it all to understand what's going on. And as always, email me, message me in Discord, whatever you have to do to get a hold of me if you have questions. Get a little over two weeks to get this done. Should be plenty of time, I would hope. This is a little bit longer of a lab manual in that part of it is kind of your typical Git process if you need it. So I've got a few guides here. Uh, you have your standard one from GitHub. You have one where it's a little bit more loosely written, I suppose. It's actually a pretty decent guide. If I... Okay, control clicking apparently doesn't work today. Um, just one. So simple guide for getting up and going with Git. We've got some links for downloading if you want. Again, I'm going to be using the terminal as I do little demos throughout the semester. Feel free to use whatever you're comfortable with. I've got some options um, in between these links, basically. So general point is that I've got a guide for if you've never, if you haven't cloned a repo, cloned a repo. Once you're there, I've got all the steps you need to do a basic update and commit and push. So lots of verbiage here. And if your eyes start going cross-eyed and you gloss over and you fall asleep, here's the TLDR. Get pulled to get your changes from your teammates. Make your changes, track your changes, commit your changes, push your changes. So pretty straightforward. Um, I have also updated the base repository for the term projects too. I noticed a couple of you were sneaky and already forked it. Make sure that you do a merge if you went ahead and got that going already, because there is now meeting minute template and a project proposal template up there. It's pretty straightforward to do like right in the GitHub interface. If you need any help or anything with that, let me know. But basically just do a, uh, you'll see the message that says 350 bases ahead of you by like three or four commits. Then you just do a pull request and then automatically merge and it should be okay. But point of this homework is to get you basically up and going with GitHub and to get you up and going with your term projects. So part one, create yourself a personal repo, name it 350 HW2 and then your last name. I like to do this, apparently not everybody does, but anytime you see angle brackets and something, replace this whole thing here. So I don't want to see any angle brackets in your in your account names here. So this is effectively a cheeky way of me getting you to work on a personal portfolio page. We're going to be using this repo throughout the semester as well for personal things, but ideally you could use it at the end of the semester and it's not just a useless homework assignment. So for now, it's private. Create a repo, add a little bit of information about yourself. Make sure you add me as a collaborator so that I can track it as well. And that's pretty much it for the individual aspect. The thing that's worth, worth talking about here is the term project side. So one through four, all personal, individual effort. Five and beyond is where you have to work together as a team. So. The way GitHub is structured and the way that we're using this, you know, we're not using Classroom or anything like that right now, unless we need to later on, but we're going to stick with the straight up normal GitHub just so that it's like every other GitHub interaction you may have. Uh, one person will be the project owner. This is a limitation of GitHub. Only one person has owner rights. Everybody else is collaborators, including me. So basically, one person's going to fork my repository and then you're going to invite your teammates as collaborators. So it's like an extra step and a half for whoever is owning it. Um, and that person's going to have access to the project settings and all that. And when we're done with the semester, you can all, like if you all want to have a copy of the repo, you can fork it to your own accounts, for instance. But uh, make sure that you add your teammates and me. You'll need to get their GitHub names. I will probably share the class spreadsheet for who owns what GitHub name and all that to make life easier for you. And then a couple more points here. So everybody has one little bit to do with the term project repo. 
I want you to update the main readme file with your name and a link to your private repo. And that will show me that you all have access and that you know how to do a commit and things of that nature. So basically for this one, I'm going to look at the commit logs to see, make sure everybody did it rather than just one person doing all the work. Uh, do, 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 do. Two more things here. So you're enough to start doing your weekly meetings now. I promised that was coming. It starts today. Every week, please hold a team meeting. Don't care in what format, Discord, Hangouts, Zoom, whatever your preference is. Just do a short meeting. I don't have a hard cap on how long it has to be, but you have a template in GitHub now for what a meeting minutes should look like. So here's the repo updated. Got a folder for meetings. And here is your template. So basically just copy and paste what's in here and add a new file every time you have a meeting. So I've got the actual format of the file name too. Basically once a week, every Sunday night at midnight when I have the deadline set for, just make sure you have your meeting minutes uploaded into GitHub. And you know, I'll just check to make sure you're all on track, that you're not you know, falling behind or anything like that. So if you have any questions, and you, you may have them as we go, feel free to chime in and, and ask. So just push all of your meeting minutes into this folder, and it'll, it should be fine. OK, so you have your meeting minutes. And then the last thing with this homework, and the reason why I'm giving you two weeks to get it done, is you know the personal part and the, the initial team part that should be fairly trivial, shouldn't take you that long. I am also asking you for an initial project proposal. So all of this time I've been saying, hey, your team should start thinking about what you're going to be doing, You know, maybe start coming up with ideas and technologies. I've been seeing a lot of chatter in the Discord channels about that, which is good. Um, but if you haven't, now is the time to start really thinking about what you'd like to do. In the Docs folder, I have a proposal template. So basically, here are the headings that I'm looking for. Uh, and basically what I need to see inside of these sections. So who's on your team? What's your team name? What are the basic concepts of your project? What technologies are you going to need for it? What's your plan of attack? And then these last two things, good project manager, software engineer, and me. Think of a anticipate, anticipated timeline. So you don't have to have everything set in stone right now, but like, what are your major milestones? Um, you know, what are your major features of your project that you're working on? And approximately how long will it take to make them? Eventually, we'll turn this into a Gantt chart when we start talking more about that. But just kind of an idea of project planning so that you can kind of appropriately manage your time. And then this last one is actually, you know, it's not always something we think about as engineers, but what are the problems that you foresee? And be honest, right? You're not going to be penalized for, well, neither of us know how to program. Um, that would be an anticipated problem and a learning curve to overcome, right? Or we want to learn Unity, but nobody here has used it. OK, well, that is an anticipated problem or hurdle, but you have a plan for you know, going through tutorial videos or things of that nature, right? So just try to anticipate hiccups and proactively take steps to, to minimize them, if that makes sense. So um, again, yeah, you have your template here. The instructions are in the Word doc. And I've got four questions for you to answer here. Uh, you see that putting the URL to your personal and term project repos is in here. This basically just comprises all of the steps that I asked in the lab manual. So for the personal repo, it's 50 points for making sure that you've gone through all of the steps, added all the content, that kind of thing. So if you're looking for a rubric for grading, that's what it is. Did you put the correct sections in? You know, is it grammatically correct? Things of that nature. Uh, spell check your document as well, because I will take a harder look at that this time. Um, the ethics assignment wasn't as bad. I've, I wasn't as critical on, on uh, grammar and spelling for that one. But you got two weeks for this. Should be plenty of time if you are you know proactive with it. Any questions on the assignment at all? I'm excited to see what you're all coming up with. So um, look at it hopefully as a positive rather than a negative. And if uh, GV students lagging, I'll 
keep an eye on chat to see if any questions start filtering in. <laughs> all right, if we are all okay with the homework, then we will move on to process models. Uh, one other thing I, I forgot to mention, I think there are a few of you who don't have um, channels in the Discord. Is it on my end? Oh, okay. I'm not getting any dropped frames or anything like that in my stream settings. It's possible it's mine. I'm streaming. My kids are streaming their school. I think my wife's in a meeting. Mine is fine, but I'm unwired. Well, the nice thing is that at least it's not terrible. So that's good. If if you're lagging, then at least you should be able to catch up hopefully fairly, fairly soon. I'm just kind of looking through my settings in Streamlabs here really quickly to make sure there's nothing wrong. But uh, all right, yeah, let's get back to the stuff here little crab dance. All right, so last time we talked about kind of the overview of what software engineering actually is. And today we're going to get into the, the model side of things. All right, so this again, this is more stuff from that textbook. Pretty good if software engineering is one of your intended fields and you're really, really interested in the hard back side, <laughs> the, the hard software engineering. Um, but we're going to just cover a few more things from it. We haven't strictly gone over these activities, you know, we've kind of talked about them. We talked about having to do testing, the developments, one piece of the puzzle. So we've kind of gone over, gone over some of these things. But what we have to do for any good software engineering project is to have a good rigorous process for putting it all together. So how do we have a formalized, rigorous way to deliver something that has measurable quality? Right, measurable quality is kind of an important concept. It's not just that it's good, it is measurable according to your um, artifacts that you set up that I've met all my requirements, all my test cases are passing, things of that nature. <clears throat> so let's talk about the process. The process, the process, the process. This is something that I like to kind of roll my eyes at as a normal human being, but as an engineer, I understand the need for it. Every single project needs to have a formally defined process. Depending on your project, you may need a different process. <clears throat> and what I mean about this by this is that pretty much every, um, any software project you have, and honestly, any engineering project, if you take a step back and look at it, is going to have a handful of steps that are all the same. So you're gonna have your requirements step, you're gonna have development, testing, software integration, release, all of these various aspects that you have to go through, they're gonna be there for every single project. The notion of the process, and why I put this in air quotes, or maybe all caps or anything like that, is that these steps are all gonna be there, they're just gonna be put into the puzzle a little bit differently. Right, so I might slot requirements in later if I'm doing something a little bit more agile focused or requirements will go at the top if we have very well-defined requirements. So it just is a matter of what your project needs are. And I, as a apparently an, an ancient person on the internet now, <clears throat> I tend to like the older style of process where everything is more set in stone at the beginning and you can just do your your development activities. Whereas kind of the new world of software development is that everything has to be flexible, right? Your customers need to have input, your users need to have input on the process, and you almost get into an iterative push and pull type of situation where, okay, we don't have hard requirements at the beginning, they're evolving over time along with the needs of the, the business, the customer, the market, for instance. So we have different viewpoints here. And the keyword of today is going to be trade-offs, honestly. That's going to be the keyword pretty much for every software project or 
discussion, honestly. But what's more important to you right now and what can you live with, for instance? So overall, process, 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 process. We are going to consider this in terms of effectively a glorified block diagram. All right, so each phase of a process is going to have lines going in and lines going out. The important part is where those blocks go, what is going into each block, and what is going out of each block. We might have sub-phases or sub-processes. We're going to have um, ways to go back, ways to go ahead, um, stakeholder inputs, so on and so forth. Uh, we're also going to have uh, constraints, meaning that this could be in like in the slide here, there's schedule, there's monetary constraints, safety constraints, basically what is going to focus this aspect of your project. You also have resources, people, money, knowledge, all of these things are going to be necessary at various phases here. And why do we care? Um, <clears throat> this is probably one of the drier parts of software engineering in a uh, field full of dry topics. But <clears throat> this gives you consistency. This gives you structure. I can guarantee when you go into industry, you're going to start following some kind of a process for your project, depending on your environment, obviously. You might be following Agile or something a little bit older. But all of these processes are going to be a requirement for, for instance, like an auditing body. So somebody external is going to come in and make sure you're following your process to a T. They don't care which process you're following. They just care that you're doing it. Right? This gives you consistency. This gives your project structure. This ensures that the output of your project is believable in that you are not violating any, any, pro or any requirements, safety concerns, ethical concerns, so on and so forth. Also, a nice little thing here, too, is this allows you to reflect later on. So let's say you have a project. You followed Waterfall, which we'll talk about in a moment very brittle, non-flexible type of process. Everything went to hell. Um, customers were angry. Your project was late. There were all kinds of problems. You delivered something really good, but it was over budget and it was over time. Well, why did this happen? This is one of the aspects here where you take your experiences and maybe for the next project, you try it a little bit differently. All right, so this process didn't work. How can we modify it or use something new? Uh, and I kind of harangued uh, the earlier session if on, on this as well. Let me take two seconds and say that if you become a project manager and you pick a process and your team's doing great, they're following it, then you go to a conference and you find out all about this new process and then you make your team switch to it, I will disown you. Um, do not make engineers change processes midstream unless there is a mission-critical need for it. So... Just a, a heads up there. Uh, so why do we care about these models? Uh, my headset's doing some weird buzzing in that ear. Sorry about that. Basically, again, we're trying to, to tailor our development to our particular problem. And it's going to give our engineers a way to ensure that they know what's happening next and that they know what to program and that they know what to test, things of that nature. Any of you ever hear of the software development lifecycle? It's very similar to a process. It's a very circular process. So basically, it's plan, system, implement, test, I think. And it's just a little circle of a it's almost pie chart-esque i suppose but just it's a circle of development basically these are the key steps that you're going to have with any project and you don't necessarily well you care but each process will have a different set of these phases and where they factor in so you're always going to have to have requirements right this is going to tell your engineers and your testers what the system is supposed to be doing how implementation is supposed to happen Right. We'll get into requirements analysis and elicitation and what a good and a bad requirement is and all that fun stuff later on. This may be different depending on your process. So if you go a more formal route, you know, a more statically defined project, this will be very specific 
natural language written out requirements for you know this sensor operates within this this particular range of values this vehicle can only go between such and such a mile per hour if the cruise control is on so you, you're basically building out your features whereas you get into a more flexible process something like agile <clears throat> requirements become a little bit more flexible they become kind of like user stories where your features and your your desired outcomes are a little bit less rigorously defined. Later on, you'll have to make requirements, but your features are basically going to be built based off of like index cards, for instance. And here is what this feature should be doing, right? So things of that nature. Uh, you're going to have your system, your architecture level design. So what is the big picture of how all your pieces fit together? How does data flow from module A to module D, so on and so forth? You get into your program level. This is where we start talking about our various you know, low-level UML models, like class diagrams or sequence diagrams or things of that nature. Things you all will be doing eventually. And then we take all of this initial effort and we turn it into code. right? So requirements tell us exactly what is going to happen with our code. You just have to translate that into Java, C Sharp, C, Python, Lua, you know, whatever your language is of choice. Then we have to test it. Does our code work? Does our code satisfy our requirements? Do our requirements satisfy our design decisions? So there's basically this whole notion of traceability from requirement to system architecture to program lines to so on and so forth. And you have to deliver your system. Is the client happy with what they got? <clears throat> um, and then we have to maintain our software. I develop an app, I release it on the Play Store, and I will maintain it by releasing bug fixes, patches, you know, read through the user comments and pick out the ones that are actually non-automatically generated, or I'll get user feedback whenever an error occurs and I get an automated stack trace or an automated sequence of events that cause this bug to happen. Right? So we have to basically plan for maintenance in our in our process. Maintenance can be uh, not argued, but discussed. Like, how long will I maintain a project? I'll release patches for two years and then I'm done, something like that. Or if it's a passion project, you probably maintain it forever. See Dwarf Fortress, 20-some <laughs> years and counting. All right, so that's all the high-level stuff. Let's talk about the models, and that's pretty much all we will do for today. So we have a handful of models, and there are variants to each and every one of these. There are basically revisions for all of these models that are per I, they're basically either shortcomings are identified, or a particular business environment has determined that this model is great, but we need this. So keep in mind, what I'm going to be showing you and going over today, this is how the academic community views these particular models. If you go and work in industry, and let's say you pick up, hey, we love the spiral model. We're going to use that. You may modify it for your own personal business needs. The important part is that whatever process you're following is documented. Um, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you're going to be picking this for every project either. It's good to be aware of what these are. Unless if you are the top dog at your company or the head of quality or something like that, all of this is probably going to be predefined for you. It, it depends on your environment, right? If you go to a startup, who knows what the process is there. But if you go to a middle to larger tier corporation, they're probably already going to have all this defined for you. But it's good to know what they are. All right, uh, caveats done, I suppose. Let's talk about Waterfall. This is one of the oldest software development models that are out there, software process models. It was based around manufacturing processes. So if you think of manufacturing and how linear that can be, the same concept comes out in Waterfall. So I'm going to just kind of pop these all up here. Basically, <clears throat> Waterfall is a great process if your requirements are set in stone. Right? Nothing changes. 
<clears throat> and that's why I said these kinds of models are somewhat brittle. You have a very, very rigorously defined initial phase. Here's what the customer wants. Here's our requirements. We're going to build off those requirements, all of our other artifacts, get to development, get to testing, get to release. Here, customer, have your project two years later. We're done. So you're going to have these kinds of milestones, these steps. So this is waterfall. And I've got a picture here which helps a little bit. So what we see is this tiered model where it's modeling a waterfall because software people love our cute little puns. Start off at a high level, requirement analysis, get into architecture, program design, coding. So you can see that everything's flowing downwards until we get to release, maintenance, that kind of thing. What's the one problem you might see with this? And I kind of alluded to it already. Anybody have a guess for the problems here? There's no emote for coffee. Yeah. What are some of the issues with this kind of a model? Consumer wants to add something after design has started. Sure. Features changed. Customer wants some input here, right? There is no room. Returning to old steps. Yeah. There is no way to go back. If you want to go back, you have to start over. Pickups in production. Yeah, so we release it. We put our code onto a uh, onto a board. You know, we burn it onto EEPROM or something like that. And we have to change our software. I mean, holy crap, that's going to be awful. <clears throat> you have to go all the way back to requirements analysis because everything has changed. There is no way to go back here. And again, we are rigorously following a process here. If we skip a step, we're going to lose our ISO certification. And then we're effed in terms of the market. OK? You can't just like go around willy-nilly. You actually need a formal process to go and change something. So here, you get to testing, you get to release. And like you said, there's a uh, change needed to be made for performance. All right, let's add in multi-threading. Let's declutter our memory, for instance. Hiccups in production. You have to go all the way back and go through the whole process again. And this can be years of effort. So this is not always the best way to go about things. That being said, if you have, like I said, a rigorously defined project where everything, you know, we're happy with the requirements. And if they change, then it's a new project. Well, fine, this is great, right? All the heavy lifting's done at the beginning. Then just give it to the programmers, give it to the testers, and you're done. This did work for a long time, honestly. But like you're all saying here in the chat, there's no way to go back. Any real project, especially these days, where everybody is a stakeholder and needs to have their say, you're going to be jumping around from steps pretty crazily. So you're not necessarily saying that waterfall is bad, but you're going to need extensions to handle flexibility, right? So there's no iteration here is kind of the key takeaway. Uh, the other thing, too, that I also mentioned as well, so you all got these points, right? There's no no handling changes or problems. You also have a very long wait before you get your final product because the corporation or whoever is developing the project, they're going through all these phases, and the customer is not seeing the product until delivery, whereas a lot of times customers want to have incremental feedback, right? Is your system something that we want to pay for or something that we're interested in. And I'm going to, I'm going to caveat all this in terms of like a, an industrial business project. The same things apply to open source projects, right? If you have a passion project you're working on, something fun or cool, and you're just developing this in secret for 10 years, nobody will ever see it. And nobody's there. There's not going to be any interest in you release it, right? Whereas if you give iterative steps like uh, betas, there you go. Along the way, you know, you can take that feedback and refine it, for instance. Otherwise, it's just, here's what you get at the end. Again, it's a trade-off. Waterfall is great for the programmer because everything's rigorously defined. 
at the cost of flexibility. All right, so the next phase here is let's tack on an extension to Waterfall. Let's throw a prototype in the mix. All right, so we're going to prototype along the way. We're going to build versions. So version 0 0.1, 0 0.1.1, 0 0.5. You know, we're going to kind of iterate as we go, show our users where we're at, and get their feedback. Right. So we're going to throw out some prototypes at our various stages. So here, we still have our standard waterfall model, but we're going to add some prototype phases. So here is our prototype based on what we know at the requirements level. OK, well, it's great, except for this login screen looks awful. Fix it. OK, let's take that back into requirements. Then we go to our system design level, do some prototyping. Program design level, do some prototyping, get feedback. Once we're happy, then we go into coding, testing, acceptance, release. If we see problems with testing, oh, hey, here is a process for jumping back to requirements, jumping back to system design. So you don't have to go through the whole thing over and over again. Now, is this better? Arguably, yes, because we have more flexibility here, right? We have customer input. Um, this slide here, I mean, I would argue that normal waterfall uses unit testing, integration testing, acceptance testing, so not necessarily something to focus on. But the key is that you have flexibility while still going through this kind of brittle process. So a little bit better if this is something that you really want to go with, but there are better ways to do it too. Alrighty. So we have waterfall, waterfall with prototyping. That's again, you can add extensions on as long as you are documenting what those extensions are. Even then, I mean, a certification body might not be on board with that. You just have to focus on your particular environment, I suppose. So the next one that we're going to look at, and this is kind of the end of the older style of thought for software processes, is the V model. And this is what I used when I was in industry. Uh, I think I mentioned before I used to work in automotive. We followed the V model. Nice thing about automotive is that you have tend to have very well-defined and clear requirements up front, depending on which automotive manufacturer you work with, I suppose. However, you still have to have some flexibility. Things change, car designs change, uh, systems that are required on a car change over time. So it's good to have a little bit more flexibility here. So I've got a few different pictures of basically the same model, but they give you different perspectives here. So this is the V model. On the left, you have more of your project definition, project implementation type things. And again, this is where I'm going to kind of flip back and forth between some of these. And on the right, you have your testing, your validation, things of that nature. So this would be more of your like verification side. This would be your validation side, for instance, to throw terms out that we haven't really talked about yet. So let's start with our requirements. Go to system design, go to program design, go to implementation. Very waterfall-esque still. However, what you start seeing is that we have ways to go back to the other side. So if we're at the acceptance testing side of our V, and again, this is where you know, maybe the customer is doing their own test to make sure they're happy with it, we have a way to go back if we need to. Same thing at the system level of testing. So we've taken all of our modules, plopped them into our vehicle, or you've taken all of your um, game modules, and you have published your full package. You do your testing to make sure the thing works as a whole, and then you find a problem. You can go back to system design instead of going all the way back to requirements analysis. And again, these just look like lines on a graph. But there is a rigorous process for how this is done behind the scenes, basically. Depending on your model, you may or may not have lines going in, or going in different directions. Like, you could have arrows in system testing going to system design or to requirements or to program design based on your environment. So here we have just kind of one big blob of a line back, whereas here we have straight arrows. Or here, we have arrows going the other way and hitting multiple boxes. So again, it just depends on how you implement the V model. Um, so 
here, this gives you a little bit, uh, sorry, this is what I was looking for. This particular view gives you actually a look at what some of the artifacts you'll generate at each stage is. So at the very high level, you start with your business requirement specs. So these are a little bit more high level requirements, maybe more business focused or value focused or something like that, kind of the high level what the system should be. Then you get into the system requirement spec, where this document is very formal. This is where you have all your rigorously defined requirements for each aspect of your system. Then you get to your various levels of design, your architecture diagrams, your UML diagrams, translating that into code, and then going through all your testing. Thing you can kind of consider here is you start very broad up here at this level, and you get more granular as you go. So high level, high level, lower level, lower level, lower level code. Then when you go back up, you go in the opposite direction. Unit testing. Hopefully you all know this by this point, but that's where you're testing the inputs and outputs of your functions, right? Does my function return the correct data type or the correct values? Or does it throw an error if it fails, right? So test your basis functionalities, then put them together into the whole class or package, for instance. Then do your integration testing where I'm going to start bringing in other modules that were developed, say, by your team members. Do these work together now? Then you go up to the system level, where the entire application is put together. And then you go to your acceptance testing, where you deliver it, and your customer does their testing, or you test with them, or something of that nature. So broad down to very granular is kind of what this model is focused on. Okay, so that's kind of the last of the more rigorous models. Now we're adding some flexibility here. I'm going to speed up because I'm kind of talking a little bit slow today. But we have first prototyping. So this is a more iterative process where you are basically... Oh, just here beeping. Make sure I'm not stroking out or something. Um, so prototyping is where you're going to have iterative prototypes as you go. And here you have a lot of customer feedback. So you're going to start with requirements. Could be informal, could be incomplete, maybe a little loosey-goosey. And you develop a prototype based on what you know. At this point, you're going to do user studies, do customer studies, do internal studies. Basically, what works, what doesn't. Let's refine the prototype. As we refine the prototype, you refine the requirements for it. So it's kind of a symbiotic development cycle. And so we're happy with our prototype at this level. Now let's look at the design level. Okay, So again, architecture diagrams, things of that nature. What revisions do we detect here? What's necessary to change? Feed that back into the requirements, feed that back into the prototype, and do this kind of iterative process again as we go. So design, sorry, I said system level, I meant design level. System level, same thing. Testing, same thing. Deliver the system, which is basically the most stable prototype that you have. So here you see a lot of interaction with the customer. You see a lot of interaction with the users. You're co-refining the prototype. You start talking about things like this, and you start seeing why a lot of the early access models are following uh, similar processes here for games. All right, so we effectively have live prototypes. Um, the key is that the consumer is aware that it's a prototype, not a fully developed game, I suppose, or project. A little bit of a splinter off this is a phase development model. So here you're going to be doing something kind of similar in, in theory, uh, but it's different under the hood. So you're going to deliver your system in pieces here. So I'm going to build up aspects of my prototype and deliver that. All right, so I might have a working prototype with particular features activated. That's my current release. The customer sees release. One, I'm working on version 1.1 while they're using my software and seeing what their feedback is. And then once I get enough feedback, once I get all my features done for this release, I'm going to push that out to the customer and then start working on the next version. All right, so we have something that kind of looks like this, where I will build a release, I'll give the customer that, and then I'll start immediately working on the next one. And then the customer will get the next one once we're happy with it. So again, you have a 
cooperative development process with the customer or the client, for instance. Talking a little bit less about the artifacts and things like that under the hood, but this is built in. So you do have to do your planning, your modeling, your implementation, your testing and deployment, and things of that nature. And this is all part and parcel of each release. However, each release is kind of, again, it's iterative or incremental. And I didn't really talk about incremental or iterative yet. These are two separate views of the similar process. Incremental, so I've got this figure here. Again, nice clip art figure, but basically I'm giving pieces as they're developed until at the end you get the whole system. So I've got module A here. I add on module B in the next release. I add on module C, and then that maybe is my final release or something like that. So that's incremental. I'm building it up over time. Iterative, slightly different in that I have all of the major features in there. I'm just refining each one as we go. So I might have like a skeleton function in here or a stub or maybe base functionality to get it to work. And as we go through a release cycle, I'll flush that out or I'll refine it or maybe it's good enough, who knows. But again, similar ideas, just kind of different viewpoints of the same process. All right, so that is incremental and iteration. Uh, nice thing about this kind of a view is that, again, you have early customer, early client feedback, so you can basically know what they want already. Um, you can start training early because you have, ideally, a fully fleshed out um, prototype or release or something like that, so you can begin teaching people how to use your software. Or... Um, you know, getting their feedback for how they want to use your software, depending on what your priorities are. Uh, another interesting thing here, too, and this is kind of why I like to talk about early access a little bit and why that strategy actually has been working. You can create a market for your product before it's done. Um, replace market with hype, and then you have social media, I suppose. Oh, yeah. And then, again, you can consider frequent or frequent releases in here to solve problems as they come up. So we're getting more flexible in our design process. All right, two more here. So first, we're going to talk about spiral. So this is an interesting view. Looks like a spider web. It's basically just a spiral development pattern. Uh, we have four key aspects here. You can do your planning. You're going to do some more... Uh, mental gymnastics to make sure that all of your goals, constraints, alternatives of problems come up. So these are all planned for. Uh, going to evaluate these, and then you're going to develop and test. So I've got a figure here, which is very, very busy. So I'm actually going to go into the next one. Uh, but this one's a little bit more filled out in terms of what's happening at each section of the spiral. But you're going to start a project. You're going to communicate with whoever you need to talk to developers, clients, quality, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to do that phase, go through a planning phase. Planning is going to be feasibility analyses, scheduling, staffing, so on and so forth. Next phase, do your modeling. Again, UML models, architecture diagrams. Then go into coding and testing, and then deployment. So this would be one turn of my spiral here, delivery feedback. All right. Then we go into the next one and the next one, and the next one. Again, very iterative, very incremental, for instance, right? But every piece of the release cycle is accounted for in one turn of the spiral. So ideally, we are getting fast feedback. We are being very flexible with how our requirements can be updated. All right, so it's kind of a nice view. It's, it, it's almost like a step between like a, a waterfall or a V and something more agile. Yeah, so it's uh, it's an in-between type of thing. All right, six minutes left. Let's talk about Agile. I'm giving you the scattershot high-level view of these. The important thing is basically that you know what they all do and why you would use one or over the other. Yeah, it's a secret to engineering, basically, right? Know when to use it and then figure out the, the specifics after. <laughs> um, so the last thing to talk about here is Agile. Agile is currently the biggest buzzword in software engineering, unless if something new has supplanted it in the past couple weeks. 
more than likely if you go to a forward thinking firm or newish company, it's probably going to be something agile related. You know, startups love agile. There are a ton of splinters off of the agile method, but the whole point is that whatever your process is, it follows this manifesto that was come up with a while back. Um, we care about the people and their interactions. So we don't necessarily care about the process, don't care about the tools, don't care about your case tools, your computer-aided software engineering tools. We care about people. We care about teams that work together. We don't necessarily care about comprehensive documentation. It should be there, but we want working, functioning software. Um, we care about customers rather than contracts. We care about change rather than rigorously defining requirements. Basically, very, very flexible, very fast, very agile, right? So that's kind of the idea here. Depending on um, your environment, again, there are a ton of different agile methods. Extreme programming is a fairly commonly known one. Scrum, I think, is probably taken over as one of the more popular ones. Uh, there's Kanban. There is adaptive software development. There's Crystal, which has its own set of flavors based on how safety critical you want to go. Um, <clears throat> honestly, more likely than not, you'll probably do something Scrum-esque where you have teams that self-organize. You do daily stand-ups. Um, talk about what you're doing today, what you're doing tomorrow. You know, what module am I working on today? <clears throat> that kind of a thing. There is just so much you can get into with Scrum. You can even be like a Scrum master and get Scrum certified and things of that nature. But if we kind of focus on extreme programming, for instance, and this is sounds like something straight out of the 90s in terms of its extreme, um, the key concepts are interesting. Care about communication. So customers and developers should be talking, should be refining our prototypes. Uh, simplicity is important. So if you're developing a module or a document, it should be as simple as possible without sacrificing quality, basically. So the, the KISS principle applies, definitely. Courage, this is an interesting one in that they encourage you to build good functionality early and often, even at the cost of looking silly or you know bad if a problem crops up. We just go back and fix it. right? We care about the people and that they're learning and growing as well as delivering solid, solid products. Then feedback, you have a feedback loop at every step of the way. So the customer sees requirements can be refined, use cases can be refined. Um, basically, it's a very, very easy way to have fast feedback and fast turnaround time. I'm going to leave this slide up here, but with kind of the scattershot view of these different processes, um, is there any problem that you can see with going with something like Agile? or prototype development. So basically, you have these very quick and flexible methods. What kind of problems could you see with that? Because it's, it's, I mean, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when somebody's selling you something that is the end all be all of software development. Um, what kind of problems can you have with Agile, for instance? Got two minutes left. Anybody know what we got going on here? Could leave it as an exercise to the student. You never want to hear a professor say that. <laughs> Programmer will take the requirements as test cases. Once it passes them, the software is done. Yeah, that could be a problem, right? So I think that's actually in the next slide. That requirements are a set of test cases. So if you pass your tests, you're done, right? Don't consider anything else. Yeah, test all the options. Um, sometimes it's very easy to overlook things, I suppose. There is a danger in being too flexible. I will say this, though, before we're done. Out of all of the processes, Agile seems to be at least the most resilient. I will say that. 
Continuous input from customers can lead to continuous additions. Yes, we can also add some wording in our, our contracts that you only get a certain number of prototypes or a certain number of feedback. I could see that, yep, definitely. All righty, um, I will, we will end there. So next time we'll talk a little bit more about process as well. And then we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of UML after that. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions or anything like that, on the homework or anything, um, please let me know. Otherwise, we will be done for today. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, definitely some lag here today, huh? Okay. Uh, so the only th other thing I guess is that I will probably ping in Discord each group that hasn't had a room set up for them yet, and that's just because I didn't see a request in Discord. Now that I have everybody's name recorded, I'll just create things for you. Feel free to use it. If not, no worries. Use whatever you're happy with, but uh, that's probably what the next ping will be for all of you. Anyway, hope you have a wonderful day. I will see you all Wednesday and the fun will continue. Bye, everybody.